Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show for a special programme featuring perhaps the most naturally gifted footballer ever to don an England jersey and certainly the scorer of the most memorable England goal. This week's headlines have been dominated by racism in cricket. As one of the outstanding black players to meet the full force of overt racism in football in the 1980s and 1990s, he's published a new book which contains some surprising and challenging views of how racism operates in wider society. Player is John Barnes, and the book is entitled The Uncomfortable Truth About Racism. Today, he is in conversation with Alex. But first, to your tweets, emails, and messages in response to our show last week on the continuing COVID crisis. Tracy Ann Wiseman says, in my humble opinion, I don't think any of the devolved governments seem to be listening to the experts anymore. This must be because they obviously know better not. Alan says excellent show as usual. You would think that governments would listen to and follow the advice of these learned men. It's not rocket science after all, but common sense. Sounds to me that it's more about cost than the greater good. Keep up the good and valuable work. Stevie Mack says, thanks Alex. Great information on where we are with Covid. I hope the governments of the UK take heed of the expert advice. So far it's been a total sham how it's been handled. Unbelievable, shocking and disgraceful. And finally, Karen Eastham says, my elderly father was really poorly a couple of weeks ago and they couldn't find a bed for him in three hospitals. Difficult times. Wishing your dad well, Karen, from all at the show. John Barnes became an England sensation in June 1984 in the Maracana Stadium in Rio, when the young Watford and England forward dribbled through what seemed like the whole Brazilian team to score a wonder goal. Now, in a hard-hitting book, he questions some of the accepted views on the real sources of racism in society. He explains his position to Alex. John Barnes, uh, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you. Uh, John, Asim Rafiq's evidence in front of the parliamentary committee was quite harrowing this week. Uh, I mean, what was your, what was your take on uh, what Asim had to say? Well, uh, I don't know why people are surprised. I mean, being involved in sport and being involved in society for the last X amount of years, this is something that was a feature of, of, of life, generally speaking anyway, particularly in sport. You know, we've been through it in football. Um, we know about sledging in cricket. So while it may be surprising for a lot of people who aren't in those environments, whereby in a laddish culture, this is what banter that's what people may call banter is used. Friends of mine work for Fords and, and for Vauxhalls on the line and this is language that's used all the time even today. And I don't know why we're trying to make out that cricket or football is different than the rest of society. So this is something that, that, that black people understand um, is a regular occurrence. Now, Asim Rafiq, in his evidence, he, he sort of said, look, Asian people get positions of prominence, but that's really shut them up. Uh, is, he got, is there an essence of truth in that as well? Absolutely. I mean, I've always said that the answer is not to, to give um, marginalised people, be they black, be they women, be they gay people, positions of power and think that's going to change everything for the majority. It doesn't. Um, what we have to do is we have to change the perception of the average black person, the average Asian person, the average woman, average Asian person, sorry. So, um, but from our perspective in football, we believe, and you hear it all the time, that black people believe that the, the answer is to give them more positions of, of, of prominence, whereas he's actually said that he knows a lot of South, Asia, South Asians who've been asked to, to in institutions to, to, to come on board, and in many respects, it is to shut them up. Um, so that really isn't a solution either. And is it impossible for someone in these circumstances to, to speak? I mean, I seem to remember was the captain of Yorkshire, uh, the youngest captain of Yorkshire, it should be said, but he was the captain of Yorkshire. Yeah. Is it impossible in a an accepted racist environment for somebody to say, hey, listen, I'm not taking this anymore. Is that, is that a, a too much to ask anybody to do? Well, it depends on who that person is. Because if you want to change it into the mental health issue, and you can look at Ben Stokes, for example, who can take time out for his mental health, and uh, Asim Rafiq can do that, and, and, and of course, maybe a high-profile footballer, but can the average person take time out? Will the average person in the street be the Asian, black, female, take time out and say, I won't support, I want to be heard. No, they can't. So it's okay for an elite person to be able to do that, but this is not the answer for the average person because they will not be supported. And let's look at it from the... I mean, the Asim Rafiq's evidence was moving, uh, as well as harrowing. And it was quite clear that even the kind of hardened politicians on the committee were affected by it. The people he was naming and shaming, uh, from their perspective, 
I mean, some of them, no doubt, were bad people. But as he made the point that some of them were good people, but uh, didn't realise what they were doing. Is that possible in today's society? People don't realise when they're, when they're behaving in a racist manner? Absolutely, 100%. Martin Luther King said in 1963 that it's the shallow understanding of racial bias by good people which is the bigger problem than the total misunderstanding by bad people. And we assume because we wouldn't racially abuse somebody, sexually abuse a woman or beat up somebody who's gay, therefore we're not racist, sexist or homophobic in any way. We all discriminate and until we accept it within ourselves, um, to a certain degree, um, nothing will change. All we'll do is point the finger at the ones who get caught, like Gary Balance, for example, or whoever else gets caught. And in football, there's Peter Bears and there's Liam Neeson. And we assume that that's the solution to the problem. It's not. We have to look at ourselves because we are all culpable. But your argument, let's turn to your book. When you said the uncomfortable truth about racism, mm. what was the uncomfortable bit that you were driving at? The uncomfortable truth is that we are all racist to a certain extent. Of course, if you're black, you're not going to be racist towards other black people. However, how would you feel about... And, and, and I wasn't being disingenuous, but I know that, of course, race is a, a, a big topic. So it's really... It's an intersectional book. It's about discrimination. So it's really the uncomfortable truth about discrimination. And the fact is we all discriminate to a certain degree. And until we accept it within ourselves, nothing will change. And that's what the essence of the book is. And the uncomfortable truth is not as simple as a black and a white situation. Because you do have, look at it from the, a Jamaican point of view, how do we feel about, about Trinidadians or Nigerians to Ghanaians? Or elite, middle-class Jamaicans, as I am, up, up towards black working-class Jamaicans. So there is discrimination in that as well. So it's not about racism, it's really about discrimination. Uh, and most of us wouldn't necessarily understand it. I remember many years ago when I was leading a, a Scottish bid to get the Commonwealth Games against Nigeria, mm. I started off with the assumption that all of the, the black countries would be supporting Nigeria until the Ghanaians came up and said, there's no way we're supporting Nigeria. Well, this, <laughs> this is where it's very nuanced. And of course, you know, um, and, and, and a group of people who are discriminated against and who are forgotten about are white working class people because, you know, they are discriminated against and no one talks about them. Now, uh, that, is a, that is a big issue because they're now not only being forgotten about, but they, the, the black community are being told that the reason for their discontent are white working class people who are racist. Now, white working class people haven't got any influence or control over um, knife crime, education, jobs, housing that black people are sometimes not being not able to get. But they're being told that because of some racist fan or some Hungarian fan, working class people are the reason why we have racism in this in this country rather than systemic bias. So. Uh, it's a, it's a very complicated subject. But isn't one of the arguments you've put forward, I've heard you put forward, that, look, it is important, not just how many players, black players there are in, uh, in football, but how many black managers, how many black faces in the boardroom, or Asian faces. But you, you've put a stress on that. Is that because you're relating it to power structures, or...? Well, it's more to do with, as, as Rafiq said, um, in terms of who do you point the finger at? Uh, so what happens is for our powerful black players who are taking the knee for inclusion and for, and we talk about, they, they say it's not just the Black Lives Matter, it's about all forms of discrimination. Um, I never heard one person mention the fact that there are no Asian, um, Pakistani, Bangladeshi or Indian footballers. That's not even on the agenda. And in terms of black managers, that's not even on the agenda either. So it's very easy to point the finger at a, a fan who throws a banana on the field or who abuses you on Twitter. However, real is that... Real racism, as I like to call it, is a, a, the majority of it you can't see. It's, it's obvious, the overt racism, the bananas and the, and the Twitter. But of course, when you look at the fact that there are 30% black footballers and they are probably less than 2% black managers, as much as black managers aren't being racially abused, the fact is that they're not being given opportunities. So why don't we speak about that? And that's, that, for me, is a bigger problem. But when you broke through in the 1980s as a first outstanding player for, for Watford in England, I mean, there was only a handful of black players. That yes, time. because what, at that particular time, there was a, a, a perception of a black player's ability, footballer's ability, physically, mentally, playing in certain positions, positions of responsibility, goalkeeping, whereas you had to be, you played on the wing, you had to be fast, you don't think too much, so don't put you in positions of responsibility. Those myths are now dispelled because you've got black goalkeepers, you've got black centre-halves, and more importantly, and I don't mean this, and a lot of black people take this the wrong way when I say this, you have a lot of black footballers who are making lots of money who aren't very good. Now, which other industry can you have a black person who is earning as much money as a white person who isn't even as good as, a, as some white players? And that, for me, shows that in terms of the playing, from the playing perspective, from a physical perspective, there's no racism at all, racial bias towards black players. Now, to be a manager, you have to be able to think. 
Now, what is the perception of your capability, to, of, the, of your abilities to lead, or a woman's ability to lead a Fortune 500 country, or a gay person's ability to fight in a war? And this is what we have to dispel. So, as much as we've got lots of black players now, the next step is management, and that is where you have to have the perception of a black person, not a black footballer, a black person's ability to think. Thinking about your book again, what's your uh, key audience for this book? Who, who are you trying to, to get this message across to? I'm trying to get the message across to uh, the people who think they aren't biased. Because everybody will agree with what I say, possibly, but they won't think it's them. Because we all know that people are sexist, people are biased, people are racist, people are homophobic. I got off the train at, at, at Houston today and I was walking to the taxi. I heard a conversation going on. Um, I don't know what the conversation was about, but the foreman actually said to the man, I didn't even see who they were, they were having this discussion, an argument about something. And he said, that's a very northern attitude to have. And of course, I know that he didn't mean it as a compliment. So what is the perception that he has of Northerners? And this is why the book well, talks did about... Did you ask him if it was Northern Jamaica <laughs> well, or Northern Watford? Well, I can tell you, people in Jamaica, they have a different perspective on the people on the North Coast. I'm from Kingston, and the Grill and Montego Bay on the North Coast. And in Kingston, we have a view of them probably being inferior because we're from... That's, so therefore, the, the bias that we all have is based on a perception, that, a wrong perception that we have based on on ridiculous things. Like, for example, when I first came to England in 1976, they used to have all of these Irish jokes and Irish people were thick. And I thought, I didn't think, I didn't know any Irish people, but then I was like telling Irish jokes because paddies are thick, that's what I was told. Which is not, and of course, I don't want to talk about Scottish people. And when I went started playing football and we went to the bar and they talk about Scottish people not buying a drink, which obviously isn't true, but this is how perceptions stick when you have people telling you things that aren't true. Let's take a hopeful view of this for a second. I mean, isn't this just a question of football becoming more cosmopolitan? Uh, you know, as it becomes more cosmopolitan, it will, by definition, become uh, less racist. I mean, it is more difficult, not impossible, of course, uh, for, for, for fans to target a black player when there's one or two black players running about in the opposing team. It does become a bit more difficult if you know half the side is black and, and half the other side is black. Well, it really depends on how well those black players play because we've seen after England missed those penalties when all of a sudden we spoke about this new all-inclusive England football team because we we're winning matches. Then, of course, as soon as they, three of them miss penalties, you can see what happens. So the solution isn't for you to have more black players because what will happen is if they play well, we'll love them, and if they don't play well, we'll abuse them. So the whole idea of Mo Salah changing the perception of, of people towards Muslims is not if he, if he was a terrible player, he wouldn't. And then if he leaves Liverpool next, next year, he, he isn't going to change that. So that is not real because, of course, we know sport is so emotive that fans will love you if you give them success, no matter who you are. But if you don't give them success, that is where their preconceived ideas and their unconscious bias in terms of the way they've been conditioned takes them back to then, what do I believe of this person? Very much like if a female referee walks onto the field, before we see her capabilities, most men will think, I think a man would be better. Until they see that she's very good and the man's no good, then they may change. But the unconscious bias that they have is that men are better than women at, at, at refereeing football matches. Thinking about the game you love, John, would there be anything that you saw or a symbol which you would say, yeah, we're finally getting somewhere, we're finally making the breakthrough? Or do you think that, that is happening gradually, or are we still back in the dark ages? All you can do is highlight the issues, and that's what football has always done. From the Champions League 30 years ago, when he used to pass his red card down the line, it is highlighting the problem. Taking in, he's highlighting the problem. What is next? We have to do something tangible. And sport? can't do anything to change people's perceptions. If we live in a racially biased, sexist, homophobic society, until we tackle it in society, it will exist in all walks of society. You can't take football or cricket out of that, or the police, for example, and then say, we have to get rid of it in these industries or these institutions. We have to get rid of it in society first, because any football, before you're a football fan, before you're a policeman, before you're a cricketer or a cricket fan, you are a member of society, and you carry your sensibilities with you. You don't all of a sudden go into these industries or institutions and then become biased in any way. And that's what we have to tackle. We have to tackle it in society, but we're doing it the other way around. And when we come back after the break, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about, racism in wider society. Welcome back. Alex is in conversation with one of the finest footballers to grace an England shirt. But there's much more to John Barnes than educated feet. John Barnes, you were saying you can't separate racism and sport from racism in wider society. Now, if that's the case, 
then are we looking in the wrong direction of trying to eliminate it in sport when we should be trying to eliminate it through society? Absolutely. Absolutely. We do it the wrong way. And not just in sport, from an elite point of view, you have to look at, um, and of course, I said it's an intersectional book in terms of sexism, homophobia, all kinds of discrimination. You have to look to, to, to get rid of it um, at the bottom and they'll go up to the top rather than the other way around. Because for hundreds of years, we've believed that getting more elite black people, women, gay people into positions will then change everything down below, but it won't. We have to change the perception of the average black person, the average gay person, the average woman, and then you'll have many more of them making it up to the top by their own volition, rather than thinking we can pull them up if more people get up to the top. So, and that's, and that's, that's to do with society. Think about your own background, John Barnes. Uh, you, your father, when you came to England, he was the military attaché at the, the Jamaican High Commission. You went to a, a grammar school. So you, you didn't come from an underprivileged background. It would have been relative, certainly, to most black people. You came yep. from a, a pretty privileged background. Did Absolutely. that alter the way you were treated? I mean, were you better treated at a grammar school than you would have been at the local comprehensive? Absolutely. Um, that's why I don't look at my experiences and look at either racism or... Or, or blackness from my own point of view because uh, I and what I've, I struggle with is I struggle to capitalize on certain aspects of blackness while not enduring the everyday reality of the black of the black experience that average black people the working class black people go through because as you say I came as a military attaché son my son was at Sandhurst with Andrew Parker Bowles um, we lived in Highgate we lived in Mayfair my dad had a chauffeur I went to a grammar school then at 17 I became a footballer so having not gone through the everyday experience, as much as living in London with my friends who were black, I saw what they went through and I know what their families went through. So I understand racism and I understand that that is the racism we really have to change. Not just for a black person because he's black, because a black elite person may go through or experience racist incidents when a banana comes on the field or if you're an actor and you can't get an Oscar, whereas black people live this every day and that's what we have to challenge, the everyday experience of the non-elite black people, non-elite women, non-elite gay people. And I don't go through that and people like me do not go through that. But you would have failed the uh, Norman Tebbit cricket test. If you remember Norman Tebbit, very prominent uh, conservative politician who said that, you know, it's all white people being black as long as they support the English cricket team. Yeah. You'd support the West Indies. I would have, I would have failed the Norman Tebbit cricket test, but uh, I probably would have gone to university, got a nice job and lived in a nice big house, but I couldn't play cricket. Whereas other, the average black person who fails the Norman Tebbit cricket, cricket test can't get a house, can't get a job, can't get access to social care. And that's much more important than me not being able to play cricket or football if I fail the cricket test, because I would still... And why I think this way is because growing up in Jamaica, which is an all-black country, I saw the way working-class black people were treated by middle, upper-class and elite black people. So it's not as simple. It's much more du nuanced than a black and a white situation. It's about elitism, it's about capitalism, and it's about discrimination and bias generally. And famously, in the Liverpool derby, when you casually almost side-footed a banana mm. off the field, a very famous incident, did you have the assurance? Because that takes a fair bit of poise, at least I would think it'd take a fair bit of poise. It was that because of your inner confidence in your, in your own self that you were able to do that, or when you bothered, you were just trying to get the ball? That is a very poignant picture. I do not remember doing that at all. Don't forget, this was 1988, 1987, 88. I've been playing football since 1981. And when I played, and it's not because it's West Ham or Millwall or anywhere else, that was happening every single week. A banana came on the field. Now, this is because it's versus Everton versus Liverpool in a high-profile match, two of the best teams in the country. It was highlighted. But that was happening every week up and down the country. So while people looked at that, and then all of a sudden, there's an example of an elite situation whereby we're making a big deal of an elite situation, whereby we had ignored that, for years before when it had already been happening. And maybe it was appropriate and it was great that people then started to talk about it, yeah. but that was nothing new. And that is why I say I do not remember doing that at all because this used to, this used to happen so often. And the same thing roughly happened with Mark Walters in Scotland. It, it was only when a very high-profile Rangers player had yeah, a absolutely. banana thrown up that all of a sudden it was realised that, you know, of course it was more unusual in Scotland because there were less black players. Yes, but if one had been playing for Stenhouse Muir against Cowden and Beath, nothing would have been said or done. So something of a turning point, that instant, then, because of focus of attention on it. Well, it's a turning point in terms of highlighting the issues, which is fantastic. And we're still doing it now, highlighting the issue, taking the knee. We're not talking about why we're taking the knee. We're not talking about a tangible difference that we can make after we've taken the knee to say, what are we going to do next? It's just about whether we should take the knee or not. That's what the conversation is, not why we're actually taking the knee and what it's all about. So um, once again, these gestures are fantastic to highlight the issue, but they can do nothing to change the issue.
And racism in Britain, or racism in England in particular, is it an imperial past thing? Is it something that's essentially about the empire and about visions and perceptions of, uh, of black people? Absolutely. Well, not just black people. Um, you can look at the opium wars in China, and you can look what happened in India. So it's not just about black, it is about imperialism. It is about empire. And of course, we have um, our Winston, second Winston Churchill now leading the country. And of course, it's quite poignant that we're talking about um, the, the, the cricket, the parliamentary uh, involvement in now the cricket and the language that's used in cricket when we know the language that's used by our most important person in terms of what he considers women um, with burqas to look like. And uh, I remember a headline once, or a headline, a quote that he talked about, um, bomb boys in tank tops. Um, so the language that he uses is acceptable because when, uh, unfortunately, when you're in charge, you get to say what's racist and what's not. But we're now talking about language that's unacceptable in cricket and football. But the man who've got the most power in the land has used language that's unacceptable, and no one questions that. So you think the Culture and Sport Committee should call the Prime Minister? Well, um, a lot of this is hearsay. Not from the Prime Minister, but in terms of people saying, I didn't say that, I didn't say that, I said this, I didn't say that. Uh, but things that we know, we know that he actually said are just being completely ignored. Well, he tended to write it down, of course. Well, <laughs> well that's, that's one of his that's problems. Not, that's not particularly clever. Well, it's not a problem, is it? Because what, what is his comeuppance for writing it down? He became the Prime Minister. Let's, I want to get something on the record. I mean, as, because you came to this country, your, your dad and the Jamaica High Committee, you could have played for any of the home countries. You, you could have played for Scotland. Absolutely. And if they'd come Absolutely. asking, you would have played for 100%. Scotland. 100%. And I'll tell you why. Not because I would have wanted to have played for Scotland, because if we are all honest, and that's why the book is called The Uncomfortable Truth, because it's about us being honest. Yes. Now, this is not nothing to do with The Uncomfortable Truth about racism, but, and I don't want to get anybody who plays for Scotland who is in Scottish, Ireland who is in Irish, Wales who is in Welsh, However, if they have an opportunity and England asks them, they will play for England first, as much as people will say no. Uh, but a lot of them, um, it's normally, they don't play for England because England haven't asked them. And then, like Vinnie Jones, Wales comes to ask him when he's 28, he says yes. If England asks, he would have said yes. Jason McAteer and John Aldridge, teammates of mine, played for Ireland and they're from Liverpool. Um, so it's normally, you're asked by the, the so-called uh, so-called lesser countries first. So England for, asked me first. At 18 years old, England asked me to play. Now, if I'd got to 21 and England had asked me to play and Scotland did, absolutely would have played for Scotland. Well, Che Adams has made almost the same point just in, in, in the last few weeks. Outstanding, mm. outstanding oh, against Denmark. did he actually Denmark. say he would, he would have played for England he, had he, they asked? He, he, he probably, not quite in these terms, but he yeah. said, look, I thought I could make a difference to, to, the, to the Scotland yeah. side. And, and the uh, good thing about that, you've got to be honest. <laughs> You have to be honest, you know, because, and, and we know that's the reality because there's nothing worse than being disingenuous or trying to kid people that you've always wanted to play for Scotland your whole life type of thing, you know what I mean? So you'd rather just be honest about it and he gives 100% for Scotland and I would have given 100% for Scotland. And I say that to the England fans, you know, if I'd played for Scotland or Wales, I would have given 100% because that is who I identify with at that particular time. Mm. And I used Stuart Pearce as an example of this, who's the quintessential Englishman, British Bulldog spirit, he's got the his tattoo on there, 100% for England. He has 69 England caps. If he had 68 in England caps and his 69th cap, we don't know how, happened to be for France against England, he would have given 100% because his pride, his affiliation with his new team meant that he would give 100%. And that is where this whole idea about what it means to be British or English, and it means more to us than anybody else. Because I remember when Bobby Robson used to say to us, you know, it should mean more to us. Mm. Why should it mean more for England to beat Nigeria than Nigeria to beat England? Because we're English, we're more important, and, you know, we, 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 we uh, 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 love each other more than, than the Nigerians. So the whole idea of nationalism really is not a, I'm not a big fan of. Well, let me tell you, you would have made a very considerable dis a difference to the Scotland team of the 80s and 90s. With Will uh, Johnson and Charlie Nicholas, it would have been a good night out. It would have been, <laughs> it would have been, it would have been not just that it would have been good on the field as well. Uh, I'm just interested in the, the, the book, this incident when you were on the way to or maybe back from Brazil, I mean, we're talking the Maracana oh, Stadium, when, when you dribble past the entire team and score a wonder goal as a young player in, in 1984, uh, and there's National Front supporters uh, mm. on the plane because yeah. the, the England team at that stage just <laughs> travelled in, travelled in steerage. Yeah. Uh, your attitude to that? Tell me a bit more about that. Well, I'm, I'm again, really interested. Why didn't you go and thump them or get somebody else to thump them? Well, once again, this was a regular occurrence of football. 
you know, this wasn't the first time we'd see national front flags in the in, in the stadiums when we went to play in England and walking down the street. This was a, you know, it's, retrospectively looking back, people who don't understand time, what life was like back then are appalled and saying, how, how could it be? And because we forget what it was like. But if you're old enough to remember at that time, the national front were up and down on the streets. So therefore, it wasn't, a, it wasn't anything unusual. It was a little bit more unusual to see them on the plane with us. We realized they were funded. But of course, um, at that particular time, this was just an accepted part. And you know, all of those press men who are, on the, who are now, still around now, by the way, who are now shouting from the, high, from, from the heavens about racial discrimination and how terrible it is and it shouldn't be allowed, no one said a word back then. Now, no, have they changed their perception now, or do they just know how not to get caught? Even to the extent that you scored the most memorable goal, in my opinion, in, in English history, the well, Gazers against Scotland, 96, no? Well, that's why I believe that your goal <laughs> against Brazil was the most memorable goal in English football history. But you, you scored a wonder goal. Mm. Uh, and they say, or people like them say, we're not counting that because yeah, it was scored by Black. Okay. Yeah, but I crossed the ball for Mark to score in the second, so it's probably a nil-all draw. Look, I can, I, like... I can promise you that no Scotland supporter would ever have said that. I know, <laughs> I know. Of course not, of course not. But the thing <laughs> about it is that, I mean... I, I cannot let ignorant people affect me in any way, shape or form. So that did not upset me at all because all of these people are ignorant. So therefore, why are they going to upset me um, with an issue that they have? And now I know other people think differently and if they feel disenfranchised and they want to you know, feel less than, I completely empathise with them, but that could never happen to me. So I mean, what next uh, for John Barnes? I mean, you've made a considerable impact in your views and in this book in particular. Not uncontroversial. Some people say it's, it's not the right attitude, but many people support what you're saying and it makes people think. Mm. So, so what next for, for John Barnes? Well, keep doing what I'm doing. Um, I'm trying to wider the conversation to, to the non-elite people in the inner cities to say, can we have more support for them? Can they have a voice rather than just the elite? So I'll continue to do that. And have you ever considered the field of play that, that I used to? to try out like politics. Is John Barnes Not at all. any political aspirations whatsoever? None whatsoever, because there's no political solution to, the, to, to discrimination. No political solution whatsoever. John Barnes, thank you so much for joining me in the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you. If Al Gore was intent on telling the world about the inconvenient truths of climate change, John Barnes is telling the uncomfortable facts about racism. The Barnes argument is that much of the anti-racist rhetoric is superficial, that we should be more concerned with racism in the boardrooms than on the terracing. Barnes contends that racism is deeply imbued in England's imperial past and that the extent to which people suffer from racist abuse is determined by class and power. His views are challenging for government and football authorities alike, but that does not make them wrong. And now from Alex, myself and all at the show, it's goodbye, stay safe, and we hope to see you all again next week.